when you still live in shame and rejection, you're basically saying, Jesus, what you did for me on the cross wasn't enough. Because what's happened to me on this side of my life is far bigger than what you did on the cross. You are loved by God. All right. Well, I have Alex and Henry Seely here with me. Welcome. Welcome to Canada. The two of you. Thank you. So good to be with you. So good to have you. And I'm really excited. You guys are the perfect people to kind of talk through three areas, I think, really identify where we need to be strengthened in. So the first is loving yourself, which people are like, that sounds so easy, but it's not so easy. Loving your neighbor and loving God. So are you ready? Because <laughs> it's a lot and I can't wait to yes. hear what you have to say. Okay. Yeah. So first of all. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah. So first of all, loving yourself. When I say that to you guys, what does that mean? Maybe I'll start with Henry. Like, what does that mean? Like really loving yourself versus in a, not in the narcissistic way when people think when I say that, that's what it means. Yeah. But what does that really mean to you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people struggle with that. M most of us do. And for me, I know, you know, I've been through seasons where I've not really known how to love myself. Uh, and I think so, so often we're looking for things around us to validate us or we're looking for opportunities or we're looking for, you know, outlets or we're looking for, you know, the gifts on our life to validate us. But I believe honestly as, you know, not just as Christians, but really for every one of us, because here on planet earth, every one of us are created in the image of God. And it is a, a journey that most people go on their whole lives trying to figure out what's my reason to be here. You know, what is my purpose? Mm. But if we, if we don't first know that we're actually children of God created by God, you know, we know that through our relationship with Jesus, he gives us access to know the father. And it's through that, that I think that we can really find out who we are. You know, I, I, I'm 46, been married for 23 years. I've got two beautiful kids, but it was years into our marriage and years into ministry before I really, uh, I think got a mm. God and to not need my, you know, my ministry platform or my gifting or the things about my life to validate who I am or make me feel good, good. about myself. And, uh, I think it's, it is a journey that a lot of people, or all of us go on uh, most of our lives. And I know for me, it wasn't until I really got to, to, I guess, know God in that deep, deep way uh, that I could settle in that and realize, you know what? No gifting, no opportunity, no uh, ministry opportunity uh, is, is going to satisfy uh, that longing on the inside mm -hmm. to really be known and known as a child of God. Henry, that's so good. Yeah. What you just did is you reframed from you know, it's all about me and my identity comes from me or the adoration of other people. But you, you kind of said it well, where it's like the identity comes from being a child of God, right? That, that yeah. changes everything. When you know yeah, whose you are, you yes. know, as we say, it yes. changes identity and relationship, which is really great what you just said, yeah. right? Because I think a yeah. lot of people, the struggle with loving yourself, it's all about me. It's about what other people think of yeah. me and you kind of, yeah. Smash that out of there. Well, I, I didn't create myself. Yeah, I was exactly. created by yes. a God who loves me. Yeah. And he knows, yeah. you know, who he created me to be. And when I know him like that, then I can know me yeah. in the way that I'm meant to be known and how I was yeah. created to, to best yeah. function and operate and flourish. It's great. I love that. That's really good. That's really, really good. I think again, with the identity part is, is key. And, and for Alex, you know, I think for, for you, you know, I, I'd love to hear about your thought of loving yourself, but I know, and in See Here Love, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, our own body, body image, self-esteem, confidence. We've talked a lot about shame and control and rejection because myself and every woman that I encounter has had some degree of that. It, it is part of our story. And I know part of your story yeah. is, is a struggle and finding freedom in your eating disorder. And so I think I'd love to hear that part for you. And then Henry, the support of that. I'm always big on that. The person going through it, but also the person who was supporting yeah. and watching. I'm, and I'm always really, yeah. you know, uh, very mindful of those two stories. It's not just one. It's like actually yeah. a, a two story to a one story. So uh, Alex, I'd yeah. love to hear yeah. about that because I think that kind of ties in with the loving of yourself and and that journey. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, Henry obviously explained it very, very well. And I think it's the essence mm -hmm. of why we then have the symptoms we do. Like my eating disorder was a symptom of why and how I loved myself and how much I didn't love myself because of the circumstances externally that caused me to have shame, self-loathing, uh, rejection. I think the essence of why I had an eating disorder was not because I wanted to be a size zero and because I compared myself to other women's bodies and feeling like I didn't measure up. So much of an eating disorder is so much more complex than just a uh, physical, external, superficial reason of I need to be skinny. Um, I mean, we have eating disorders at either end of the spectrum. You can be very overweight and you can be grossly underweight, but this, that's symptomatic to how you feel and you are just manifesting mm -hmm. your pain with punishing yourself through starvation or punishing yourself by, you know, mm -hmm. uh, gratification, instant gratification, addiction. It's addiction in any sort of term. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't love myself because I suffered with a huge deal of rejection as a child. So as a very little girl, I didn't feel wanted or loved by uh, my parents, even though they, of course, loved me. They, of course, wanted me. But the narrative that I was told is that I was the mistake and that I was the, uh, the person that wasn't meant to be here. Mm. Uh, oops, we got pregnant and we have to tolerate you. That's exactly not how my mum really felt about it. It's what was translated to me. And the enemy works in very, very, very cunning ways where he will use a, a distorted truth and make it your reality. So I took upon myself the sense of I am not meant to be here. I am being tolerated, not celebrated. I am rejected. Mm. So then, you know, couple that with the physical abuse that I endured, the verbal abuse that I endured as a child, it just reaffirmed the shame and the rejection that I felt as a child. So the only way that I could control anything in my life was by controlling what I ate because everything else was out of my control that I developed an eating disorder to control mm -hmm. so that I would be in control of something. Um, my eating disorder then actually afforded me validation. This is the, the sick part of society that celebrates being thin. Mm -hmm. um, magazines, media, everyone's looking for this perfect body. So the thinner I got, the more affirmation I got for how beautiful I was. And because yeah. I was so starved in affirmation and acceptance and belonging, that then just perpetuated my eating disorder to keep as thin as I could so that I could keep getting complimented, which then became this vicious cycle of addiction. And even though I loved God and God loved me, there was a disconnect that my identity was in him because I'd suffered a rejection mm -hmm. from my surroundings, my family. I then valued myself the way I saw others viewed me. And so it was just a vicious cycle of self I don't know, damage yeah. on every level. And I had this uh, for 20 years. So, Henry, yeah. you're listening to this. Obviously, you've heard this. You've lived it. What was happening with you when you were seeing your wife? I mean, and, and congratulations on 23 years. Is it your 23rd anniversary year this year? Yeah? It yeah. was, It yes. was? Oh, okay, yeah. So, April, yeah. Yep. Yes. So, congratulations <laughs> and happy anniversary. Um, you. So, you're you're seeing this. And what are you yeah. thinking? Like, what what is how, what are you thinking as as a as a man, as a husband, partner, and and then I think the the question of like when you can't do anything, how do you what do you do? And I say this as a man because I'm married yeah. to Chris, and there's you know we have lots of conversations about when men feel like out of control and they don't know what to do, what do they say, and how do they you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean. You know, as, as a guy, I think guys, are, we just want to fix everything. Mm -hmm. We want to come in and just fix it straight away. We want to know how we can deal with this. But the, the reality was, uh, it, it was probably a few years before I fully understood the depths of, uh, you know, the situation and how bad things really were. Because when, you know, the whole time that we had known each other up until uh, this point, which really came to light probably five or six years into our marriage, 
Uh, and the whole time that I'd known Alex, it's not like she had drastically lost weight or anything like that. She really was basically the same size from when I met her. And so it was more that I was picking up on, uh, you know, the, the, the times where she was, you know, a, choosing not to eat or choosing to eat a punnet of strawberries throughout the day rather than actually have a whole meal or just some other little things along the way. And also being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of, of you know, not just overlooking these things and the Holy Spirit saying, hey, just dig in here, you know. And by dig in, I don't mean go and tell her, hey, you're doing this wrong and this yeah. is wrong and blah, blah, blah. It's actually yeah. have the conversations and ask the questions and see. And so, you know, we kind of went on that journey. And really, you know, as a guy, as I said, you know, we, we want to fix everything, especially when we know there's a problem. We just want to step in and be like, all right, here's, here's how to fix it. And that was one of the greatest challenges for me is that I knew that I couldn't fix this. This was something that really only God could fix. He knows her better than I know her. He's the only, he created her, so he's the only one that knows really where that wound is and where that brokenness is that's led to this. Mm. Uh, and so just getting into that place of, of prayer and really, yeah. uh, you know, really asking God to break through in her life and also to, to give me the wisdom and uh, the patience to walk that journey with Alex. And it really was a couple of years uh, of us walking that journey together and really watching God heal uh, you know, really deconstruct the layers of pain and heal uh, those layers one by one yeah. along the way. You know, I absolutely believe God can heal and does heal uh, and fix things in yeah. a moment. And sometimes it's a journey. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've seen God do things miraculously in our lives, instantaneous healing. And we've also seen him take us on the journey. And this was definitely one of those moments where God was taking Alex on the journey and, and us together. And to be honest, uh, you know, for us, it was one of the things that really brought us closer uh, along the way of realizing that we now get to do this together. We get to, to help each other yeah. as we're on this journey of, wow. of whatever healing God has for us and whatever we need from God. Yeah. Henry, that is he, so good in that I have, I don't think I'm, I'm not outing them, but I have two girlfriends struggling currently with uh, an eating disorder and their husbands, we're all friends. To hear this as actually encouraging me, um, what you're saying to encourage them because they are fix it guys. Yeah. Like I identify the issue, Melinda. I know what the problem is. And if she just did step one, two, and three, she'll be fine. She'll be better enough. She just, you know, and it's been years. It, and, and so I think what I'm hearing you say, which has really actually struck me is it is, can be the long journey. Like yeah. it, it, it really can be, it, it might not be. I think we're part of like, let's get this fixed right away. But you said some really good things there that I it, yeah. that I didn't. Can, can I just say with that though? Yeah. I don't believe it necess it needs to be unnecessarily long. Yes, uh, and I, I agree. Times, I was going to say that. Yes, yes. Yeah, we can default to that of well, that's just my lot in life. You know, that's because of my yeah. brokenness, my broken state. This mm -hmm. is my you know my broken journey with Jesus. Yes, we all have an element of brokenness, but I think this is where the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think sometimes the the church can get. Uh, turned off from this, you know, the idea that the Holy Spirit is with us because maybe, you know, people have experienced uh, weirdness and craziness that's uh, attached yeah. to the Holy Spirit over the years. But it's actually been the Holy Spirit that has brought these things to light in our lives yeah. and also yeah. the Holy Spirit that's done what, you know, human counsel can't do. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, getting counsel, wise counsel from people uh, along the way. But the Holy Spirit is the ultimate counselor. He, Jesus left him as the counselor for us mm -hmm. because he has answers for us that nobody has answers for. Yeah. And so because of that, he would bring things to light and show us, all right, well, it's this, it's this issue. It's not, hey, here's the three steps, go and do this, right. this, and this. Yeah. It's yeah. actually... God, I surrender my life. I surrender this. I surrender my hurt. I surrender my past. I surrender my pain. I got to move on from this place of unforgiveness, yeah. allowing the spirit of God to enable you to forgive yeah. so that you can come into a place of wholeness. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Amazing. it was, that was the piece. It's honestly, it's, it's not a three step fix. Mm. Right. It's not just eat more or like, you know, Henry would tell me all the time how beautiful I was. I wasn't receiving it because my mm -hmm. posture 
was broken and fractured. It had nothing to do with what he thought of me. It was, it was everything to do with how I loved myself mm. and how yeah. I didn't actually love Ooh. myself because I didn't know how to receive the love of God. And the, the core of my wound was unforgiveness. Mm. Because I had been abused as a child, I couldn't let go of this thing. My disorder became my best friend. And it became the Lord of my life. Mm. And so Jesus was the Lord in every area. Mm. But because I was so addicted to the verbal affirmation I was receiving, because it was what I was getting from doing what I was doing to my body, yeah. I had to let go of that peace. And it wasn't until I made Jesus my full Lord, fully repented of that, forgave the people that had hurt me over the years, that I was then able to see myself as a full daughter of the king, fully loved, fully accepted by him, that then the layers built up in Christ mm -hmm. began to, I looked at myself and realized I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes. I am beautiful because of who he says I am. And I'm beautiful regardless of what I look like on the outside. Actually, that has nothing to do with how I love myself. Everything mm -hmm. is how I receive the love from my father. And because of the unforgiveness that I had held for many, many years, when mm -hmm. I broke that curse, I was able to see clearly and receive the love of Jesus. And honestly, this might yeah, be a little good. freaky to some people, but I actually got delivered by a mm -hmm. spirit that was oppressing me for years. So it is so spiritual mm -hmm. and emotional and if you don't actually allow Holy Spirit to speak to you and then respond to those things, you will be bound for the rest of your life. And you can cope through life, but it's not right. living life yeah. abundantly. Yeah. And what you're saying is we're looking at, you know, out of out of this verse in Mark about, you know, loving God with your whole heart, soul and mind and loving yourself as, as you love your neighbor. Yeah. You know, the loving yourself I found you know, even for my own journey, talking to women for 25 years, I've been speaking everywhere and meeting with people, you know, unforgiveness and shame and rejection are main major things that yeah. keep us from really loving ourselves and, and, yeah. and receiving what you said as the love of God. Yeah. I, you know, before we move on to the next, you know, loving your neighbor, I want to just talk about that because those are, those are themes that keep coming up over and over and over yeah. again. Uh, with the people that I meet, yeah. shame, unforgiveness, control, rejection. We could do like, honestly, like a 10 part series on this, yeah. but I just want to hear your thoughts because I want to see freedom in my friends, yeah. with my family, with the people that I come in contact with. And I think yeah. this would be, you know, love to just hear your thoughts on that, to love ourselves yeah. and receive the love of God. We, we got to deal with that stuff. Yeah, well, you know, ultimately salvation is not just something we get saved so that we go to heaven. Yes. Salvation is what Jesus took upon himself that freed us from every bondage. The original sin was we stood in rebellion against the you know, the the one instruction that he said don't do this. Humanity said, well, Maybe God's holding out on us, so we're going to take partake of this apple and yep. we're going to take, and then sin entered. What immediately happened was the enemy came and brought shame. Mm. So there was a nakedness. Oh, now I have to cover myself. And there was a self-help of taking those fig leaves and make, taking something that God made to cover ourselves, but that wasn't the fix. So this shame comes in. We hide from God because we think he's going to get angry at us. Yet the very thing that we're afraid of, God comes in that garden and says, I'm going to actually cover you. And he sacrifices an animal. It's a foreshadow of what he needed oh, to do yes. with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he sacrifices. He doesn't shun us. Yes, the consequence of sin is that we had to leave the garden and now do things on our terms. But there was always a redemption of Jesus mm -hmm. would come and bear our shame and take our sin so that we could live free. Yeah. Now, when you get saved, you're not just getting saved from some, you know, oh, now I don't go to hell. You're taking on acceptance as a daughter or a son of the king. Yes. And now you are 
re-established as sons and daughters right back like the garden, how we should have been. And because of that, there was no shame. There was no separation. There was no fear. There was walking close proximity with the Father. And so as we get saved again, we have to appropriate that when he died on the cross, he took our shame, he bore our shame, and he cancelled it on the cross. So when you still live in shame and rejection, you're basically saying, Jesus, what you did for me on the cross wasn't enough. Because what's happened to me on this side of my life is far bigger than what you did on the cross. And I had Mm -hmm. to get to a place where I was treating Jesus as my savior, but not my Lord. Mm -hmm. And when you Mm -hmm. hold on to bondages, you're basically saying, well, you saved me so that I could have a place in heaven. But while I'm living here on earth, I'm going to be bound up. And Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ came to set us free. So why do we keep binding ourselves up in the bonds of slavery? When he did it once and for all. So it's actually a lie that we're believing that the issues that we have, maybe the abuse you've suffered, maybe the rejection, maybe the issues of your life, that you're basically saying, well, what you did on the cross, that doesn't cover that part of my life. Mm -hmm. And so we do actually have to get humbly before the Lord and realize that everything he did on the cross was for a reason so that we could be made free. And we've got to ask the Holy Spirit in all of our lives, What's the area that I've made an idol that I'm holding on to that's greater than the name of Jesus in my life? Good. Alex, that's good. You know what? I wish that that message was being shared with our young people because, and I say this as a Gen Xer, a lot of times we just made the, the salvation to the salvation we're going to go to hell, right? That yeah. was it. But imagine if we were like, no, actually, yes, but this like just imagine if we were able to message that I, I think people would be like i get it i love that i want that i want to follow jesus because for that reason versus out of fear that we come to jesus because we don't want to go to hell and i yeah. just say that because that's another conversation i've had with many people and especially my age group that have been very wounded in, in some of our conversations and reasons why we came to jesus in the first place and i think that that's liberating that's encouraging that's hopeful that's all good things, right? That's really yeah. good. Great. It was awesome. So I love that loving yourself. And again, I think I think that's an important thing. I think it, it's the balance because, you know, like I said earlier, it's like, well, I don't want to be narcissistic and I don't want to be, you know, loving myself in, in that space. But I think it's very important that we do understanding like what Henry, you said, child of God and identity. And then Alex, what you said, what I just love beautifully is just saying, understanding, you know, say from these things, is he Lord? And if we yeah. believe that he is, then we're not going to be bound by shame and rejection and control. Uh, beautiful. I love it. It's so encouraging. All right, let's go to, I feel like I'm in a little bit of a, it's almost, I feel like we're in like a, a show, like Family Feud or something. Like, let's go to our next one for the answers for 500, please. Like, literally, um, loving your neighbor, my favorite one. So just to give you context, the past season, we were big on that. We did our Indigenous Voices, which is one of the biggest ones in Canada with our Indigenous and residential school. Uh, a, a big, dark time in Canada's history. And obviously as Asian, I'm Filipino. We had to talk about our Asian voice and talk about the rise of anti of, of Asian racism because of the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. and what yeah. people assumed and connected that with. So we did a big show with Asian voices in Canada. It was beautiful. And then, yeah. of course, we did shows about with our uh, black sisters and brothers in Canada as we were, you know, confronted with the injustice for that. So. My heart and my and see here love is so much about loving our neighbor, and and justice. So I want to get to that part, but this is like my my love, my heart beats hard for these things. But in loving our neighbor, I broke it into three parts because I think you guys can answer some of these things so so wisely. And you talked a lot about um, your marriage, which I think is beautiful. And we know the stats about marriage, and I would love in loving your neighbor. It's like loving your spouse on how you two are having a flourishing marriage, a thriving marriage, Um, and maybe just some tips. I've got people who are in, for me, I'm in my second marriage. 
It's a whole other story. We talk a lot about that on the show, about going through a very difficult divorce and my husband deciding just to leave. He didn't want to be married anymore. So we talk a lot about second marriages, blended families. <laughs> we yeah. talk about people who are entering into marriage. So what would be some of your tips, Henry, Alex, on how you two are loving your neighbor, loving one another uh, within marriage context? Yeah. Excited how to about- hear. <laughs> we could probably spend the next few hours talking about I this. I know. See, this is what I'm saying. You know what I'm really doing is I'm kind of like making notes and I'm going to call you guys again and say, yeah. bing, we're on another show together. <laughs> well, I will say this. We, we've we been married 23 years. We certainly do not have everything figured out. You know, it's been yeah. a journey yeah. along the way. And yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's even interesting putting it in the, you know, loving your neighbor in, in the sense yeah. of within your marriage. I think that's because important. Sometimes Do you good? Because I put that in. I was like, I hope yeah. this doesn't sound weird to you too. No, but well, I really believe that. it has that. to start at home. It has I to. I believe yeah. it starts at home before you can love out far. Yes. And I think yeah. sometimes it's easier in the sense of, you know what, I'm going to go do an event of loving my neighbor down the street because I can come home. And then, you know, I've allotted that amount of time. And, you know, I know that's gr- grossly you know, General. it's generalization. <laughs> yeah, no, but, no, I know, I know. You know, when you come home, this is what you come home to, you know, and when you wake up on your best days and your worst days, this is, you know, this is the, the, the relationship that matters the most aside from your relationship with Jesus. Mm. And, uh, you know, for both Alex and I having to work through, you know, we both come from very different, um, in, in some ways, different family dynamics yeah. uh, growing up. And so, mm-hmm. you know, as does everybody that comes into a marriage. And so there's always complexities that, uh, you know, how do you figure out, well, you know, this is how my family did it and this is how my family did it. And there's yeah. good and bad on both sides of those things, figuring out, all right, what does this look like for our family? But I think that's one thing that we've been really intentional about ever since we got married was, okay, this is how my family did it. This is how your family did it. But what's mm-hmm. it going to look like for this family unit? You know, not just drawing on uh, our past, but also... God, how do you want our marriage to look? You know, how do you want our family to look? How should our home, you know, I I think there's one thing that we've really focused on over the years, and we've probably heard that from more people than I can remember, that people just walk into our home and just say, wow, I just feel peace, you know, like feels Mm -hmm. peaceful in your home. And that's, you know, that's not accidental. I think it's actually very intentional. It's not that we're trying to create some mood. It's actually the presence of God in our home because, you know, that's how we live. That's how we operate. And so just, you know, I think making decisions along the way uh, of not just allowing things to, to happen just because that's how it does for everyone else or that's how it did for our parents. But, all right, what do I want my marriage to look like? I've had to ask that. I mean, I ask myself this, honestly, every couple of weeks and have done for the last 23 years, what do I want my marriage to look like? And where, where's the deficit in my own life between what it should look like and how I'm living right now? You know, what, I think so many times, you know, spouses want to put it on each other of like, well, if they, if they were just better in this way, or if they were just, you know, a little more like this, or if they, you know, if my spouse was more encouraging or less blah, 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 you know, they're important things, but if we all focused on ourselves and what we brought to that relationship, then I think our marriages, you know, would flourish in a greater way. And one of the things that I've honestly, uh, I, I've probably grown so much in on the receiving end is one of the things that Alex has been so amazing at is she, she doesn't, she's not a nagger to, uh, you know, na- nagging doesn't get it doesn't, yeah, doesn't, doesn't bring the change doesn't that you do want. Anything. I'm just going to say this. <laughs> and I think, some, honestly, sometimes we think, well, you know, it's usually the wife that's the nag. But I've met plenty of dudes that are nags as well. So <laughs> let's just put that out there. This is not yes. gender specific right now. Yeah, right. Um, but what it did, Alex, she wouldn't encourage me at where I was. She would encourage me in who she knew God had called me to be. Mm. And it wasn't this weird thing of like, well, you're not this, you know, you're blah, blah, blah. It's just yeah. actually encouraging each other the bible says encourage each other you know in your faith to good works and so i was the recipient of that along the way having this you know this uh situation that i walked through in in my teenage years where i really felt like i was nothing where i was worthless Mm -hmm. you know not good enough not talented enough all that sort of stuff which is a whole other story but it was in in part alex's words of encouragement that brought me out of a lot of that even in our early years of marriage and so we've learned to do this and honestly she's much better at it than i am but i've i've 
grown in this over the years of encouraging each other in what God has called us to. So rather than her saying, man, I wish that you would just blah, 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 it was more like, you know what, I really love it when you do that. You know, I really appreciate when you do that. It's all those little things, just those little tweaks that I think make a huge yeah. difference in your marriage. Yeah. So. yeah, I mean, I think we made so a decision good. to honor each other yeah. um, that this is the most important investment. Yeah. So mm-hmm. why would I bring down mm-hmm. the person that I've chosen to be in covenant with? Ooh, yeah. good. And if... Our especially marriage. in public with other in people. public and in private but in public yes. especially because you yes. see a lot of husbands and wives put each other down with these little mm-hmm. you know off the cuff comments that are quite and passive aggressive yes mm-hmm. passive aggressive little yeah. passing yeah. comment that puts down rather than builds up yeah. uh, I would never I would always cover rather than expose I was always one to encourage and speak highly about um, because I, that's what I wanted our marriage to look like. So we'd always made a decision to be kind to one another, to never yell at one another, to never treat each other like some siblings treat each other. I think some relationships become like roommates and brothers and sisters. And so th- there's no awe and wonder in that mystery of love. Like we're supposed to represent mm. how the relationship between Jesus and his bride is. Yet we treat each other like crap half the time. (laughs) And then we wonder why there are so many divorces, (laughs) you know, in Mm -hmm. in even Christendom. Because we're not understanding that this is covenant, not contract. Mm -hmm. And when you understand covenant, you understand that you're there to serve Mm -hmm. rather than be Mm -hmm. served. That's the whole point of covenant. So I choose to love you regardless of how you are. And that can get a bit sticky, and I'm not talking about staying in an abusive marriage and right, staying right. in, you know, I'm not mm-hmm, pleasing yeah. my heart, because I know a lot of people react to that, but I actually see a lot of breakdown in marriages because, you know, we people don't have a vision for what they actually want to see in their marriage. And so I think we've had, you know, I'm a fiery, passionate person. Um, I'm very vocal and opinionated. I've had to learn how to submit to a husband who is gentle and kind and so I could either have said, well, this is the way I am, deal with it. Or I could have allowed the Holy Spirit, which I did, to say, well, in this area, in this area, in mm-hmm. this area, you need to change. And then the same with him. He loves to work and sometimes work would encroach in our personal life. So he had to make some changes. Mm-hmm. And so we've just always had to lean on the Holy Spirit speaking to us individually, taking responsibility for our stuff getting us to be the better versions of ourselves so that we can better serve the other. Mm. And this is what we've done for 23 years. And honestly, I would say, and you might might not agree, but (laughs) honestly, we're living our best years ever. Awesome. We really are living our best years. A thousand percent. There's just no tension in our marriage. Yeah, Yeah. well, I think people, people would hear that and think, that that's can't how possibly, it can't possibly. It can't possibly be true, but it actually is, yeah. and and that's not because Alex and I are exceptional people. No. It's that we're surrendered people. Honestly, <laughs> that's good. it's mm. it's we are mm. in in many ways just very very average people. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think I, I'm quite an introverted person. Uh, you know, I'm creative, and I had been in the past maybe a little more moody because I am you know a little more that way but it's not an excuse for me to stay that way That's right. I have to be surrendered and yielded okay. to the you know I can't be like well I'm a one or I'm a blah 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 on the Enneagram and Enneagram. so that's my excuse for it you know <laughs> oh I've heard that those, a lot <laughs> yeah and those things are helpful to yeah. you know to yeah. understand well okay that's maybe why I respond that way but that's not an excuse that's it's right. actually we've I've been like, all right, if, if there's an area of deficit because I'm wired a certain way, then I'll, let, let me allow the Holy Spirit to, to do the work in me so that mm. the fruits of the Spirit would be yeah. evident in my life regardless of what Enneagram number I am. The Enneagram is not attached to a particular fruit of the Spirit. You know what I mean? We should be all of those fruits regardless of what our personality yeah. type is. And so I think just being mindful to say, all right, I'm, if I'm yielded in this, that means, you know, I'm yielded to what the Bible says. Yeah. If the Bible says don't go to sleep, you know, in anger, then 
whether I feel like that or not, I have to say this is the way it is. And yeah. so for 23 years, we've never slept in a, you know separate beds unless one of us has been unwell or we've been away. Even when we've you know yeah. had a not great moment, we've made a decision. We're not going to permit this in our marriage. And that's, you know, just yeah. one of the things that I think has helped us along the way. Yeah. And again, we're still learning. We're still very much learning. That's good. You know, as I'm listening to so many things are being said that I think are important for people who are wanting to get married or going into marriage or in marriage and going, I'm stuck. But it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. There's, you kept using words like kind and serve and surrendered and yielded. Like these are all... These are all words that a lot of people shy away from or don't like, right? Because it sounds yeah. like I'm losing myself. I'm losing control. Yeah. You're going to take advantage of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what I'm hearing you say in those spaces, actually, that's why the marriage works. Because yeah. we're surrendering and we're showing kindness and we're serving yeah. and we're you know, su submitting and we're yielding. Like words that culture and people have freaked out yeah. about. Totally. These are actually yeah. things that make it work. It, it's like yeah. this counter... Yeah. intuitive understanding in, in a marriage or what we've what culture has created as yes. strong strength you need to be this yeah. that's that's good yeah. that's good yeah. I, it's you know kingdom minded it, it is yes it's exactly that's it right it is counterculture and it is kingdom minded it's that upside yeah. down what you said yeah. out like the opposite yeah um, the opposite in, in that's in the in the opposite life right yeah but yeah. i think i think with that i think people fear that with that i'm losing control but actually it's such a place of release it is. because yes. now you're not having to fight for it. It's mm -hmm. you have, you've set up a, a platform mm -hmm. and a foundation that you can both right. flourish. This That's is right. not, you know, I mean, I, I, Alex said this out of her own mouth. So she is a very strong person, but very submitted yeah. in that. Very. And so, and I love that she's not had to uh, tone down who she is as no. a person no. to be a weak wife or a weak yeah. person in our marriage. She is, all sorts of fire in the best possible way. But with that, because we are submitted to each other, uh, there is a sense of she's not in it for her own sake. I'm not in this for my own sake. We're in it to serve each other. So in that, I'm like, all right, how do I best serve you? She's like, how do I best serve you? And, and we figure out that journey it together. It, it's so sad to me when only one party wants to make it work mm -hmm. and the other party doesn't. And yeah. honestly, if there are people out here and you're like, well, I, that's the marriage I want, but this isn't happening. I, I really want to encourage you to pray. Yeah. Pray for your spouse, yeah. but pray for you to have the key yes. how to unlock the area. You know, the male responsibility as a husband is a greater responsibility than the female. Mm -hmm. So many women bark up against submission. Mm -hmm. But if you understand that it says, wives submit to your husbands, right, as head of the home. But then it says, husbands, Lady. love your wives mm -hmm. like Christ loved the church and laid down his mm -hmm. life for her. If, if you could understand and see, it's his part. See, mm -hmm. I've often heard men say, see, the Bible says submit woman, but they're not mm -hmm. loving their mm -hmm. wife. Mm -hmm. Now, I've watched my husband love me where he has denied himself to serve me at times where I'm like, oh my goodness, if you're willing to do that for me, I can't help but submit to you because it's a two-way thing and when both of you have made a decision yeah. to do your part i'm telling you you will have a marriage that the world looks at and wants mm -hmm. and that's what i think is the biggest compliment for us mm -hmm. is when people come to our church you know we're pastors of a church and they say the most beautiful thing about you is both of you are completely in your own lane but you're not fighting for mm -hmm. prime position you're completely submitted, yet you're so released to be yourself. And then Henry is completely priest of the home, but he's not lording it over you. And I honestly think this is the perfect picture of how God intended marriage to be, is that we are co-laborers together in life, partners for life and partners in ministry. And so that our children feel safe and secure and the world around us works. And I think the enemy has been on assault and assignment mm -hmm. to destroy marriages because when you destroy the unit, again, you don't love your neighbor in your home. You can't love your neighbor as yourself because it destroys everything. And the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. So we need godly marriages to rise up so that we can actually be an influence in our cities and our nations. So good.
Thank you for that, you guys. It's so good. I was taking notes. It was really good. <laughs> and as I segue now, because as you talked about this, it was really interesting. In one of our previous episodes, um, I was talking to a, a psychotherapist, Christian counselor, and I was saying, how do we have great marriages? She goes, we have them when we have great singles. Yeah. <laughs> I go, what? Yeah. She goes, no, no. Yes. Great marriages will be when singles are are great and strong and and yeah. supported. So I I, I want to ask this as we loving our neighbor about how we can best support single people. A lot of my, are my friends, a lot of people that are part of like sort of the See Here Love community are singles, single women and single men. Now, granted, yeah. not as many single men because we tried that. We we're like tag a good single man all on our social media. Just so you guys know, I think yeah. we got one. I'm not joking. Wow. I said tag great single women. Do, 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 do. Like it literally wow. was like it ex yeah. it blew up. Like wow. there literally was a complete disproportion. Anyway, all that to say, <laughs> um, how can we best support single single people? And and yeah, that's within our church, but also in life because that's one of the hardest things I'm hearing is single people going, we just don't feel best supported. Do we belong in church? It's not geared to singles. It's more geared to families and, and married people. How can we love our single people well, would you say? I mean, I think we have a pretty decent amount of single people yeah, in our church, uh, as well yeah. as families. Uh, you know, I think the most important thing is helping people understand that a spouse, you know, un unlike Jerry Maguire's, you know, <laughs> movie there, yes. a spouse is not going to complete you, you yeah. know. It's right. Jesus is the only one that can complete you. Yeah. and. From that place, you know, marriage is, Alex says this all the time, marriage is not two halves coming together to form one. It's two whole people coming together. Yes. You know, and that's the place that we've got to be. We've got to be whole, at least as, as much as we can be. You know, whole and healed um, before we come together is at least going to give you the best foundation that you can for marriage. And there's always going to be growing and learning along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, helping our single people become the strongest you know, faith-filled believers that they can be yeah. dealing with the stuff, letting go of the past, you know, dealing with the yeah. unforgiveness and the brokenness mm -hmm. and maybe the, the marriage, uh, the, uh, the family, you know, divorce in their family or whatever it is that's, uh, you know, has been a burden to them. Helping get that stuff figured out uh, and dealt with before you get married, I think is a huge deal. Yeah. And I think, um, I think singles need to be in church. Yeah. I, 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 I'm going to say something that maybe is a little controversial, but I don't say believe, <laughs> I don't actually believe we're supposed to cater for a singles ministry. Yeah. Like I hear this a lot, even yeah. in my own church and I have, Ugh, I have sorry. not <laughs> bought into it because yeah. I don't, I don't believe it's necessary. Yeah. I believe get involved, get yeah. connected. Yeah. Be in mm. groups of friendships. Like we, we are in a generation right now that mm. we're so plastered to our phones. Yeah. We don't even know how to interact with one yeah. another. Mm -hmm. And if I put on a ministry for you, mm. it's not going to help because you're not doing this outside of church anyway. So right. we, we've got to get, get our singles involved, mm. part of the church, mm -hmm. serving one another, being part of teams because that's how... That's how we got together. Yeah. You know, I didn't need a singles ministry. I didn't even need to be supported by the married people in my groups. Yeah. I just got about doing life. I was happy yes. about being alive. Yeah. And so I think our singles, I think we're a little bit entitled to think that, oh, well, we're this exclusive group over here and we're not being supported. I do believe in discipleship. I do believe we need to be part of cell groups and connect groups and and honestly, mm -hmm. find your people. Mm -hmm. I was really proactive in always having co-ed relationships. Yes. I didn't just hang out with four girls and watch movies every night and then wonder where my husband was going to walk in the door and sw sweep me off my feet. We went out with a mm -hmm. bunch of guys and girls and we worked it out until we found each other, you know. And so I think we need to, like Henry said, we need to have healthy singles mm -hmm. that are dealing with their stuff being the best versions of themselves and then getting them involved in community so they yeah. can serve together. Yeah. Well, I think that. with that too, you, you know, when you are doing stuff with people, I think, and this is no dig at people who are, 
on dating apps, all that sort of stuff. But if you're spending more time swiping through a list of people that you, you know, mm-hmm. they're saying something about themselves, but you have no idea That's who true. they really are, you know. <laughs> right. But when you can yeah. get in community, you know, serving, yeah. getting in mm-hmm. church, being around, you get to know people and yeah. you also get to, you find out your commonality. You know, yeah. one of the reasons why Alex and I ended up together, honestly, was because we were so, we were doing so much church stuff together that, you know, we realized we both love the same things. We both love, we're yeah. passionate about the same thing. Yeah. We have a heart for the same thing. And that was one of the things that drew us together. Uh, you know, even though yeah. she was the hottest girl on the planet, yeah. I wasn't necessarily <laughs> the most good looking guy. So but because I'm not being ridiculous, so ridiculous. because we had a Sweet. commonality and that yeah. was yeah. really, yeah. you know, yeah. that brought us yeah, together and a common love for Jesus and all yeah. of that. And so, yeah. so no, that's really I, I, good. I don't know if it helps. <laughs> no, it is good. I mean, with COVID and the pandemic, it's been hard yes, on I know. to me. Absolutely. And Canada, you guys, we have, we yep. have in Ontario, just so you know, Toronto area, we have had the strictest yeah. lockdowns so in the sorry. world. Yeah. Like, yeah. we are going nowhere. I mean, currently yeah. right now, we finally have patios open and only 15% of our stores can be open. Like I'm we are so still in it. Sorry. And so it's yeah. been really hard up here. I think for a lot yeah. of people are just like, Oh my goodness. But yeah. I have, I, I agree. I would say, yeah. and I say this and it's hard because a lot of my girlfriends had, have been on dating apps and they've been struggling. But for me, I would say my entire life, I never had to work for a relationship in that yeah. I was always actively doing things, whether I was in yeah. sports or I was in drama or if I was in, I was doing missions or I was in church. Like I was very involved. And so I always met guys that way. And so I, it was really strange for me when people are like, you know, are you struggling to date or whatever? And it was, I always downplayed it because it was actually, no, I actually had way more (laughs) choice than most people because they were like, you're involved in things. You're interesting. You are, you're loving Jesus and you're changing the world, but you're also playing soccer and you're cheerleading and you're also you know, playing piano. Like it was just because yeah. I was very interested in yeah. what the world offered and things. Like I, I always yeah. was. So that was always what you're saying, Alex, is exactly yeah. what, I, and I don't like single ministry. I hated that. I, I was actually yeah. like, I never want to be a part of that. No. Cause then that's kind of like pegging me into this. Yes. I was like, I was always wanting to be involved in multi-generational, yeah. intergenerational groups, right? Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. I think that's yeah. really wise and smart. So yeah, I'm listen. sorry for the pandemic. That is a hard. I challenge. know it's horrible um, for people. But you know what? I probably would have worked away if I was single. I would have gotten zooms and met people. You know what I mean? Like, come on, let's let's do a group where we do a book club or do something yeah. where we're connecting. But you know, I mean, for you know, America, we're completely open now. It yeah, feels like COVID I, we never see even that. Happened. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know it's sad because I'm you know I'm Australian and I Australia is the same. It's really strict. I think the Commonwealth yeah. countries are stricter than a there republic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know I'm I'm kind of grateful for that yeah. being in America. But you know I just think be the best version of you. And I think oh, the reason yes. why you didn't have trouble having men be attracted to you is because you were loving life. And I think if if you're a woman on here. The most attractive attribute for you is enjoy your life. Yeah. If you look desperate and dateless, you're not attractive. <laughs> yes. And um, But if you Agreed. are active and completely full of life, men are going to be completely attracted to that. And so, yeah. you know, men know how to pursue um, and, you know, speak well of men. I, I have to encourage our girls in our church too, because, you know, they'll be like, oh, there's no men here or the men here just don't know how to pursue and they don't know how. So keep mm-hmm. speaking death over yourself. Go for it. Keep speaking death. Or you can choose to speak life yeah. and go mm-hmm. tell the guys, man, you're, you're an amazing man of God. You're yeah. a legend. You know, I can just see mm-hmm. purpose over your life. Yeah. I'm telling you, you start spreading good news mm-hmm. to these guys, they're going to ask you on dates. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think one, your speech. One, yeah, of the other, yeah, yeah. one of the other challenges I think that we've seen, at least with this you know, generation of singles right now, because of technology uh, and, you know, this whole, whether it's Instagram, whether it's, you know, Facebook, whether yeah. it's a dating app, the fact that there's no end, you know, like there's no yeah. end to your Instagram feed. It yeah. just keeps going yeah. for all eternity mm-hmm. if you Options. want it to, Options. you know. So there is a sense of like, well, what if there's a better option? You know, like I'm going to keep swiping through mm-hmm. these because, you know, mm-hmm. that person looks good. They've got, you know, uh, but mm-hmm. what if there's a better option? What if there's a better option? Yep. What if there's a better option? Yep. Can I just say this? There's always going to seem like there's a better option. Yeah. 
but you will never, you can have the greatest marriage ever, even if that person is not necessarily the greatest option. If you are both committed, if you're both first and foremost committed to Jesus, yeah. secondly committed to each other, you can have the best marriage yeah. that anybody could ever dream of if you're committed to that. Yeah. And uh, I think through that, you end up falling more and more in love and attracted to that person. Yeah. I, I, I think... I've become a better, this is a funny thing to say, but I've become a better looking person because I've been loved well by my wife, if oh. that makes sense. Oh, I, I love that. I attest to that. And, Ooh. you know, I think it's, there's, a, there's a scripture in that because there, God said, I need to make a helper comparable mm. to Adam. Right, and I wasn't comparable, so he had and, to make me better to but, be comparable. But this is the thing that I think <laughs> women come in and make men better; yeah. they really do. Yeah. And and mm. I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And and honestly, I would say that I think I think we've both, it, we get this comment often these yeah. days because you know yeah. I'm 48, he's 46. People are like, "Why are you guys aging backwards?" And I'm telling you, we're aging backwards because we're full of joy, mm. we're full of peace. We're full of love mm. and we're full of purpose. Yeah. And honestly, that is the key mm. for, for marrying well. And, and you know what? We have purpose that we are yeah, fulfilling that's the call it. of God. I would say that too. I, I love that. And finally, I'm hearing people say the same thing. I always said to my girlfriends, like, if you are purposeful, if you are confident, if you know you're loved and you're loving others, it is so attractive. Like, I, you know, yeah. and I would say, I go into a situation. I can't even believe I'm telling you this. And I'm like, I wouldn't be, I would think a 10, I would say in beauty scale, but man, confidence puts you at like 20. Yeah. So I could actually go into a place. This is horrible. That I'm outing myself. And I would say to my girlfriends, I will get that guy, not on my looks, but confidence, my wittiness, my Come just on. profound wittiness and storytelling, my love, you know, all of that. And they'd go, oh yeah, I'm out. And I would literally go up and it would just happen. It was so easy, like to a point where it was so easy that I'm like, oh, this is scary. And so girls were like, that's really scary. But I was like, because I think when you do, when you are loving yeah. life and others and, and yeah. you're confident, yep. not, nothing it's can stop amazing. you. Because at that's the end of the right. day, if they, didn't, if they weren't interested in you, I'd be like, oh, well, you're lost that's and right. I'll go. That's there, exactly. wasn't, there was Imagine nothing. If, yeah. Imagine <laughs> if everyone had that philosophy. <laughs> That, oh, and dear. I actually had that mm. philosophy. If you don't like me, you're lost. Exactly. Thank you, Alex. And people are like, well, I'm like, honestly, it's like, oh, well, you miss yeah. out on this yeah. and the fun that I can bring That's to your life. That's right. That's right. And anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my, okay. I just, I'm outing Becca. She said, you've got this like weird waterfall thing. I'm like, yeah. I don't know if it was a JLo thing inspired. I'm just it. putting my hair up and, it's cute. oh, I love, I love it. it. You guys are so fun. Okay. We got a few more and I know that just, this loving your neighbor, obviously on loving our neighbor best, you're in a, in a big city, you have a big church, lots of different people. How are you, how are you working through this loving our neighbor well in, in, in such a time as what we're finding ourselves in? And just, you know, as you're leading, as you're leading people, how are you guys doing that? Um, I think that would just encourage others at, in leadership of how you're, you're, yeah. We're loving our neighbor that are that are different than us. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's been, I think, for for all of us, and I want to say, especially in the church, it's been a, a very difficult season to navigate. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. not just obviously all the COVID stuff, but all the racial stuff here in the states that we've experienced mm -hmm. in the last year. Uh, that's only been exacerbated by people's, uh, you know, distance and locked yeah. away from each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, the isolation, the frustration with all of that, I think it's just, it's been like the perfect storm from that point of view. Yeah. So, yeah. and, you know, for Alex and I being Australians, we've lived here in the States for nine years. Yeah. Um, but it's been like, you know, this fast track uh, of learning the history of our country and why... Yeah. Racism, especially, is such a particularly hot topic here uh, yeah. in the States. Uh, and, you know, the, the background and the history in regards to slavery and all these sorts of other things that we didn't necessarily experience in Australia, even though there was racism, there's never been slavery. And so that, you know, that adds a whole different dimension dynamic um, to, I think, racial tension. Uh, and, you know, just the, the residual effects of that from generations. And even here in the South, it's like a whole other level of it. And so, you know, we, we, I think the first thing that we did was just, you know, humble ourselves 
and yeah. say, we need to learn. We don't know. Yeah. We yeah. don't know why some of these things are issues. We yeah. want to know. We want to know what. We, we don't want to just know what they're teaching in school. We want to actually delve mm -hmm. deeper yeah. and find out from people that have experienced it and walk through it. And they're, you know, it was their grandparents that were experiencing some of these things that now are literally history in our nation. And yeah. so I think putting ourselves in a place where we said, listen, we, we don't know. Also, it's not on somebody else to teach us. It's actually on us to learn. Ooh, and so we've, we've been very mindful to just, you know, mm -hmm. as honoring as we can uh, and respectfully as we can, just sit and have conversations with people and say, yeah. help us in our lack of knowledge in this, you know, let's have these conversations. And yeah. so I think leading the church through that, having some honest conversations, yeah. some tough conversations, some conversations that here in the South, some people didn't like, uh, you know, people have left our church in this last year and that's fine. You know, people have different mm -hmm. opinions on some of these things. And yeah. I'm not here to say that our church is, you know, the greatest church that everyone needs to come to our church. We, I just know what we're called to do as a church mm -hmm. uh, is not sit on the sidelines and also not make, you know, racial, uh, reconciliation or tension or anything like that the primary uh focus of our church it's yeah. a part of the kingdom of god well, you know part our, of the ministry of reconciliation yeah. so our focus is jesus yeah. uh and yeah. so under that banner what yeah. how do we live and so that's mm -hmm. that's definitely been yeah. i think for us just figuring out how we can love and honor the people around us more than just doing um you know stuff for the community how can we actually be there for the community and so we recently uh, had a beautiful afternoon uh, between services in our church where we just opened up a space uh, just a couple of months ago for some of our uh, black community, some of our, uh, you know, Asian community, people of color from all over the place to come and just actually share how they felt uh, and how they yeah. felt in this season. And not just kind of wallow in that. Yes, a place to be very vulnerable, but also to realize, you know, we have a hope in Jesus uh, and that we can be part of that change as the church. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was actually Very one of the most profound. significant and profound times nice. that we've had in our church. People got to pray, got to share their heart, got to worship together uh, and realize, you know, not all the pain's going away today, but there is hope. Yeah. And so how do we live with that hope and how do we be, how do we bring that hope to others? Mm -hmm. That's really good. You know, I was just talking to an indigenous sister on a last uh, podcast and I asked her, you know, as your sister, how can I su best support you? And she goes, Melinda, first change the question. It's yeah. how can I learn from you? Yeah. And then you need to learn from us. And I was that's like, right. good. Yeah. I need to actually that's learn right. new language. Yeah. And I also need to be in a different posture because yeah. the support is like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Yeah. They're like, ah, oh. actually, yeah. before you do that, actually learn yeah. about yeah. our history, yeah. about our lives about us about our culture and i said so what's the then how can i learn from you she goes listen to our music listen. buy the books yeah. we write buy culturally appropriate artwork and in, and in, in meant like it literally you know like immerse yourself yeah. in the culture and in that you will then know how then you can best support oh. us i'm like okay yeah. beautiful yeah. like it literally and what you're saying Henry's exactly yeah. it. It's like, I'm going to yeah. listen. I'm going to be in a posture of yeah. learning about our history, about what's happening. And then yeah. we can kind of work then on how we can best be an yeah. ally to you and support you. It's good. Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, good. one of the things that I'm grateful for, which obviously has been challenging in this season with COVID, but I'm mm -hmm. grateful that we have been able to travel a lot in our lives. And, uh, you know, when we lived in Australia, we were only a few mm -hmm. hours flight from, you know, Singapore or Malaysia, Philippines. Yeah, which is where I used you to know. live, Singapore yes. and the Philippines for most of, oh, the, man. Yeah, most of my I, life. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> I, I miss that part of the world in a yeah, really me deep too. way because we would spend <laughs> yeah. quite a bit of time there. I love the food. I mean, we still just pine for actual authentic Asian food. And even when we lived in Melbourne, you it's, know, I, just a huge like huge Asian population. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we just love that culture. We had yeah. a lot of Asian friends. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, travel, it's, it's one thing to read. Absolutely. I think that's incredible. Mm -hmm. But to travel and actually put yourself yeah, in other cultures uh, yeah. is, is just really... And then when you go there, not to look at all the reasons why it's not like where you came from or, mm -hmm. man, I would just wish that they would do this 
in a way that I'm more familiar with. Actually stop, you know, when you, when you go and travel places, stop looking for the, the food that's familiar to you. The stop Western, looking for the yes. Western, you know, oh, if I could just find a Starbucks uh, or a shopping mall. Yeah. You know what? Go and experience other culture yeah. and, and mm-hmm. don't have Starbucks for a couple of weeks and yep. see how people do coffee or, yeah. you know, something that's cultural from a food point of view in their world. And yeah. experience that. And I tell you, I'm, I think we're better mm. people for it. Our kids are better people for it. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, I think it's, it's really humbling to realize there is so much diversity on the planet. And really, our representation of culture is such a minute part of that. And that's the glorious nature of this world that God yeah. has created. Well, that's I remember awesome. Brene Brown saying this. Um, she said, it's really hard to hate up close. Yeah. And I yes. think loving your neighbor is getting close. Yeah. It's, it's learning to yes. move into neighborhoods and move in close proximity to yeah. the people that you don't understand. And yeah. when you get in that space, your love causes you to listen, yeah. learn, and then you can lead. And I don't think yeah. you can, li- you know, people go into lead and, and then work <laughs> out later. They forget about listen and learn because yeah. their love is actually more about them um, more than it is about the other person. And so I think we've just learned to empathize and put ourselves in their shoes and just try and feel and understand Mm -hmm. uh, what anyone could be feeling. It's like, you know, people who are homeless or people who are less fortunate, rather than going in to fix them. I remember a friend of ours, when he started his feeding program, it all came where he had a strategy and a plan to get this person out of poverty by making him work for a certain amount of dollars and the homeless man was so offended because he said you're missing the point I just want a friend I don't Mm -hmm. actually want you to fix me I want you to befriend me and I think if we could just stop trying to fix people and see them as projects and realize that honor is seeing the God in every human being the world's going to be a really beautiful place to love to loving one another yeah, I think that's so great. And and as soon as you said Singapore, Malaysia, like that was my I, I grew up in the Philippines, just context. I was actually adopted out of an orphanage by Canadian missionaries wow. and then lived in the Philippines and Singapore. But we, you know, weekends were like, let's go to Hong Kong and go hang out in yeah. Kowloon and yeah. have real Love dim sum. It. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's go to yeah. Singapore and go to the stalls and have real nasi goreng. Like this yeah. is my life, right? <laughs> like and then I came to Canada in in the late in the mid eighties. And I was like, so can I have real Chinese food? And they're like, go to the mall to Manchu walk. And I'm like, <laughs> so my family did, I'm not kidding. We went, you know, cause my parents were missionaries and my brother and sister who are their uh, birth kids were actually more Asian than actually Canadian. It's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. The, the cultural shift, yeah. that's another show, yeah. but we would go to Manchu walk in the mall. And I remember eating it and we all spit it out because it was the most yeah. disgusting yeah. thing. Not right. But yeah. So, and it was weird too because, you know, I come into an all white neighborhood. I'm like, we're all like my friends from the Middle East and Dubai and my friends yeah. that were from Japan and from Malaysia yeah. and, and Australia. We had a lot of friends actually in mm. Singapore who were Australian in my school. And so, yeah. yeah. I think it changes. When you actually get to know somebody, it changes yep. everything because then they're yeah. real people and not That's just right. a statistic or yes. somebody over there. Yeah. But thank you for, oh, nasi goreng and this stuff. Oh, <laughs> dim sum. I know, I know. Now I'm actually getting hungry. I'm like, okay. Saute, um, saute. Saute and real yeah. peanut sauce, like the yes. real, real, you know what I mean? peanut sauce and roti with roti, yes. banana and Nutella oh, and mm. all the things. Oh, yeah. And just that yum, everything. Banana leaf curry. <laughs> banana leaf yes, curry. Yes, banana leaf curry. And we would have the real Singapore noodle. Like, yes. The stalls yes. were where we went every Sunday after yes. church. Yeah. yeah. Oh, on that, let's it. finish up because now I'm like, oh, maybe I need to go get some dim sum. Okay. Some har gao and shao pao and shao ma and <laughs> things like that. Okay. <laughs> let's love God now <laughs> in our in our meal because I think we did loving yourself, loving your neighbor. Thank you for that in the learning posture. Now loving God. And I think, I mean, for that we could be, but I think just let's end it off with, you know, how – how you love God well, I think for people saying, I mean, it's almost like an easy question, like, how do you love God? But really, truly loving God. Um, and it's a struggle sometimes, especially for me. I, I've been in Christian ministry, Christian broadcast, Christian, Christian, Christian. And so you assume by what you just do, it's just loving God. But I've had to ha- I've had some checks along the way going, mm, 
that might not be loving God. That could be loving the institution or the ministry yeah. or, or, you know what I mean? And it kind of freaked me out because I'm like, whoa, am I actually doing it because I love God or is it? am I just doing it for the sake of this is my job or I'm, anyway. Thoughts on just loving God corporately and community, what you guys are doing, and then we'll kind of like wrap this up, even though I'd love to chat with you guys for a long time. But loving yeah. God, what would you say? I mean, I, I think it's easy for all of us, especially if you're in, you know, ministry. But <laughs> yes. the reality is we're all called to ministry, you know, every one of us, whether we're on staff at a church or a Christian organization or not, it's actually mm-hmm. a side you know, aside from the fact that we're all called to be ministers. Uh, and I think, you know, when you when you walk with God, you can get easily tied up in the things that you do for God, thinking that is loving God. And that is a part of it. It's a response, but it's got to first start, you know, from that place of relationship. And I think for every one of us, there's a temptation, you know, many times along this journey um, to to lose sight of that and to lose that real first love for God. And uh, I'm honestly, I'm grateful that we're in a church and also I'm in a marriage where, the, you know, there's accountability in the sense of it's not somebody looking over your shoulder. It's just when you're around people who are really in love with Jesus, when you're finding yourself in that place, you become aware of it so quickly yeah. of like, wow, man, that person is loving Jesus in a deep way right now. Mm-hmm. And I think that inspires and encourages people. And so I'm, I'm you know, really thankful to not only pastor a church like that, but actually be immersed and part of that. Uh, and I think too, you know, I think that's an important thing. I think a lot of pastors along the way, they disconnect and they think, well, you know, I'm doing all this stuff for the people, uh, but actually you're one of those people as well. Yeah. And uh, it's really, I mean, it's imperative from that point of view that, you know, your relationship with God is just fresh. You know, it's, yeah. it's, not, yeah. it's not just routine. Routine, I think, is really helpful. Uh, but it's not just, here's my 20 minutes, you know, of reading the Bible. Or here's my yeah. 15 minutes that I've got for prayer in here. It's actually living that lifestyle of, you know, just constantly coming back to the Word, constantly praying. I was sharing this the other day, but, you know, I love to pray in the car because it's the one place where I'm not distracted by things around me or people around me. Yeah. Sometimes I have to get out in the country roads to not be distracted by the bad drivers that, here in Nashville. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, for me, yeah. it's, you know, like I can't be looking at my phone. I can't be answering mm-hmm. emails. I can't yeah. be like the dog's barking or, you know, something's happening. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm in a place where I'm locked yeah. away. And so I think just having those things in your life yeah. uh, is, is really important. Yeah, I, I, I believe it's all, like if you read John 15, you know, Jesus talks about remaining, abiding mm. in him. And you can't actually do anything apart from him. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the, it's a no-brainer. I, I, don't, I would not know how to love myself or love others if I first didn't love Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, my relationship with Jesus is so, it's so fluid and it's so here that it's not disconnected so many christians live compartmentalized christian lives like sunday is when i love god for two hours and i'm immersed (laughs) in god for two hours but then the other days of the week i don't even talk about him i don't even think about him i don't even pick up the word i may listen to a podcast that's not loving jesus that's like visitation with somebody and we visit with God but we don't abide we don't remain in God and so I can't live apart from him he is my life source he's the breath in my lungs he's the reason why I wake up in the morning I'm in constant relationship I'm more in love with him than I am with my husband or my children my husband can attest I'll I'll be talking to the Lord constantly just He'll be like, oh, there she goes again. It's like, I'm talking to myself, but I'm actually always <laughs> talking to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So my love for Jesus is an overflow. It's not something I do or something that I go, oh, I must spend 20 minutes with Jesus in the word. That's not a relationship because I look at my relationship with God the same way I look at my relationship with my husband. And if I'm not spending as much time communing with God as I am with my husband, then he's in the wrongful place. And so my life is, I'm a better wife and mother because of my love for Jesus. I'm a better friend. I'm a better pastor because I'm constantly in relationship. So learn to fall in love with Jesus. Don't make it about 
well, there's God over here and Jesus yeah. over here and Holy Spirit over there. Fall in love with the one who saved you and you won't be able to get up a day without thanking him. And every morning, my first thing is either good morning, Holy Spirit, or good morning, Lord. Like, how, what are we doing today? It's just he is the first thought that I have when I wake up. Right. Henry and Alex, Lee, thank you so much. That was so great. I mean, I've never really, I've done lots of interviews hundreds, thousands in, so in, in, in many years in the work I'm doing. And, but I've never really done it where I, you know, asked two people like, let's go through loving yourself, loving your neighbor and loving God in less than like, you know, an hour and a half. And, and you guys just nailed it. It was, it was, it was great. There was so much learning there. And I think in the series about, you know, helping people be strengthened this summer in the series, yeah. uh, I really believe a lot of what you've said in those loving yourself, loving your neighbor, loving God has really encouraged us i wrote notes and is really going to, going to strengthen us thanks for the great work you do in your community and church really appreciate it thank you for working so hard on your marriage because <laughs> that's a that's a beautiful example of of yeah. love and uh, thank you for just it being in a posture of listening and learning wow. to others i think that's thank a you. great example we need to have more people yeah. stop talking yes and i say that to and myself listen. and start listening and learning and leaning yeah. in, right? And then yeah. amplifying yeah. and uh, leading people to Jesus. So thank you yeah. so much for You're great welcome. work you do. Really appreciate well, you being on. So thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. It's great.